Okay. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, for to the uh, final uh, final <laughs> lecture on this. What I'm going to do today is cover a broad swath of problems uh, that we don't have yet, but I think they will come up. Also, a number of possibilities and pos uh, positive uh, directions to take, uh, which also we don't have yet, but where we should, I think we should be moving in uh, if we're going to deal with democracy in the digital age, given that so much has changed. And so uh, basically, first of all, I'll be, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the future of security uh, in general. Uh, that make, we should make us rethink security arrangements that we've had up to now, and then look uh, just briefly at uh, the way electoral politics has gone. Um, discuss slightly the issue of economic and technological domination that, um, and some of the problems that Europe has with this and, uh, and what it is, uh, where its emphasis emphases have been, uh, which I think are not always the right emphases. Uh, and then I'll look at um, the development of public services, which I think is actually crucial for the European Union uh, and the continent to develop. Um, and so those are the, uh, in other words, this is not going to be a coherent whole because we are looking at different directions of, of where things could go. And uh, I hope that uh, some of you at least will work on these issues to uh, move onward from where we are today. The first issue, which is um, I think the uh, one which we have to deal with mm, most um, seriously uh, and most uh, quickly, given the way things are changing, is um, the issue of security. Now, if you, uh, if you remember last time we were looking at, I mentioned a different, all kinds of different threats that we can have um, and where that leads us to from hacking to DDoS to all kinds of other issues. Uh, you know, one of the things about these courses is that um, every time you, uh, <laughs> every time you, you have a few weeks in between uh, lectures, something new happens. And as we see that the entire uh, East Coast's uh, digital infrastructure for delivery of energy in, uh, in the United States, the East Coast, the United States, the uh, with a ransomware attack on a company called uh, Colonial, which uh, supplies the East Coast uh, or much of the United States in terms of population to be more precise uh, with its gasoline, its uh, jet fuel and, uh, and its oil. And of course this is in the modern era become digital. And uh, it was attacked just last uh, last Friday or so with uh, ransomware, which as you recall, is when you freeze up someone's computers or their data and say, pay us a large amount of money or you will lose it. And of course they didn't immediately pay. We don't know what's going to happen with it. There are various conflicting stories as it is ongoing right now, but so, People now, as a result, even though there is not yet a gasoline shortage, there are long lines in the United States uh, for people hoarding gasoline and kerosene, uh, all because of news that a company has been hacked. So, I mean, you can see that <laughs> real life can be altered significantly even with, uh, with news of a hack, let alone a real hack itself. Uh, and the other wonderful news that again shows that um, uh, the importance of cybersecurity uh, was that it has now been determined 
that the solar wind sack, which I talked about here earlier, in which uh, the largest penetration of U.S. government uh, uh, U.S. government uh, databases and uh, and computers in general, as well as a number of private companies, was ultimately due to an intern who changed the security password to. Solar winds one two three four. That is the sole security for access to solar winds. Now, this is I mean that's not even two factor authentication. So we're dealing with um, what we are dealing with uh, is that uh, is human beings. No matter how sophisticated we can get with our technology someone who can be a total idiot and just simply ruin everything. Um, so that's just the, the last few days. Uh, so, I mean, given the importance of all of say government databases, the delivery of energy to a uh, hundred million people on the East Coast of the US, we realize that we do have to start taking uh, cybersecurity side of things much more seriously. But I think that that's just a small part of it, which is that the um, that when uh, when we think about where we're going, we have to look at the history of security over over the ages and realize that ever since the beginning of what we might call war, which was probably long before humans became humans, but somewhere in the sort of uh, early hominid stages when we had become slightly more social animals. Um, and when, and as social animals, um, we would we would band together and we would see conflict taking place between people who were i mean sort of our our ancestors who would attack other ancestors mainly for their own benefit to either to get their uh, the food of other people of the same species or the females of other species or to get their property say in the sense hunting grounds or something uh, and I stress the social side of this because non-social animals may kill their own kind, but it requires social behavior and organization to carry out war where groups of, one, of a species attacks groups of the same species uh, and makes it di distinguishes between only a group membership, but otherwise they're all the same people. Now that's basically has been war ever since it began and continues to this day. Um, and in fact, um, you know, people beginning with Thomas Hobbes, the uh, British philosopher uh, who wrote uh, the book Leviathan on the beginning of the state and basically argues that the state began with, with war, uh, that uh, the state of nature of human beings was uh, bellum omnium contra omnes, which in English is a war of all against all. Uh, and it took the state to actually control this so you don't have this uh, massive killing and stealing and raping going on all the time, which then leads to social organization uh, where some people are warriors, others are supply food uh, and leading to all kinds of things such as division of labor and taxes. Uh, all right, I won't get into that, there are entire, I mean, that's a whole course on itself. Um, but basically what the, the, the concept of security in this, uh, in this is, 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 has been a part of our lives since our evolutionary ancestors, part of our lives as a species. Uh, and so other than acquiring food and procreating to guarantee you a offspring, security is one of the most fundamental needs of people. Now, when we talk about security um, and war, basically we have to understand what is the nature of war been? 
Um, and war is has always, uh, whether you win it or lose it, has always been, a, and whether we're dealing with tribes or bands or nation states, uh, it's always been a matter of numerical and tech or tech and or technological advantage. If you want to win, there have to be more of you or you need to have better weapons, which effectively increases your numerical advantage. So, you know, uh, in the case of numerical advantage, we know that, for example, during the, uh, the Winter War between uh, the Soviet Union and the Finns, uh, against about uh, some 200,000, 300,000 uh, Finns, the Soviets sent over a million men. So just, just to swamp the Finns, uh, Finns nonetheless had technological advantage more in the sense of skills, but than, uh, than technology. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, I mean, if you're going to be technological advantage also is if you're going, you're not going to do well with uh, uh, if you're, say, um, early Estonians or Latvians or Balts uh, with bows and arrows against uh, German knights coming in with on, on, uh, on horses with armor. So technology has always been uh, one of the key factors in um, in conflicts and security and war. And you can see that all of these various inventions, be it the, uh, the bow or the English longbow after that, stirrups, armor, gunpowder, all have changed the nature of conflict. Um, I mean, the big advantage is taking, going from throwing a stone to taking a stone and putting it on an arrow or putting it on a piece of wood as an ha ax handle, and you can do much more. Now, the point of all of this is that war and conflict and security has always come down to, if you still recall, or if you ever even learned it, because I don't know about these days, but New <clears throat> Newton's second law, which is that force equals mass times acceleration. That is that if you want to know how much force there is, you weigh something and then you see how quickly it accelerates. You multiply the two. And acceleration, of course, is a change in velocity or speed over time. Um, so if you actually reduce the, uh, the formula, and or if you recall your math from or your physics, force equals mass times uh, distance covered divided by time squared. This, as you know, or should know, is kinetic force. And all use of force, basically, since those same hominids uh, picked up a rock and threw it at someone, or if you recall from the movie 2001 A Space Odyssey, there's that scene where a pre-hominid picks up a bone and hits another pre-hominid and kills him, which was the point at which man acquired tool use as a form of violence. And so all force basically since prehistory until the end of the second millennium, that is 21 years ago, has been kinetic. And so you can increase force uh, through greater mass, a bigger rock, a bigger bomb, through increased velocity, a better using a bow and uh, or for a bow and, with a bow and arrow, or using a trebuchet in the Middle Ages, or a modern Patriot missile. Now, the problem is that in the past 20 years or so, I would even date it more specifically to 2007, is that you can now use force in, in conflict without, where there is no mass where there is no, effectively there's no, well, the distance doesn't matter in the sort of Newtonian sense. There is no acceleration. Uh, the time on earth is instantaneous because, because digital messages move at the speed of light. And so what we have 
what we are on the verge of is a revolution in security. I mean, we know about, we've talked about the hacks. We've talked about the DDoS attacks. We talk, I mean, we've talked about these things as if they were um, things we have to deal with. And we do have to deal with them. On the other hand, what we really have to understand is the implications of a world in which the traditional forms of, of warfare need not apply. They haven't gone anywhere. I mean, we still we just went through a big crisis in Ukraine where we saw that there were massive amounts of troops and tanks and all kinds of other nasty things um, building up along the border of Ukraine. Those are all kinetic weapons. So kinetic warfare is not going away. But now we have a new kind of warfare, and it changes a lot in terms of how we think. The first known, and I'm sure there were many before, but the first known national hack of one country hacking another was Moonlight Mile uh, when Russia pen penetrated the US Department of State or Defense, sorry, in 1999. Um, we have had lots more since then. I mean, the Chinese apparently, presumably, ha when they hacked the Office of Personal Management in the United States, took uh, tw 23 million personnel records of US federal employees, including uh, the psychological profiles of CIA agents. Uh, we have seen politics manipulated by the hack of uh, Hillary Clinton's emails and then their subsequent doxing or publishing by the Russians in 2016. We talked about the Solar Winds Act, uh, which we discovered in 2020, uh, in which basically Russia gained access, it is thought, to almost all of the US digital infrastructure. More broadly, there are just two hacking groups, APT28 and AP29. Uh, APT stands for Advanced Persistent Threat, which is, it's a CIA term, but everyone uses the term APT20, APT to describe these. APT28 and 29 um, have inter alia penetrated the German Bundestag the leading German think tanks, the US Congress, the US State Department, the foreign ministries of Italy and the, and the Netherlands and Denmark, I already mentioned the US foreign ministry. They've, they've even penetrated WADA, the World Anti-Doping Agency for again, political reasons because they wanted to uh, I don't know exactly what they wanted to do, but in fact, WADA had determined that a large number of Russian athletes had in fact been involved in doping. Uh, just uh, a month ago, uh, less than a month ago, the foreign minister of uh, Sweden called out the Russian ambassador because one of these groups had hacked into the Swedish Confederation of Sports. Now, what they were doing there, I have no idea. But nonetheless, the, the, we see that this is going on. Um, but the hacking, except for, the, I think, the case of the, um, I mean, the weaponization of the hacking in the case of Hillary Clinton is a passive thing. And there's this whole sort of understanding in the world of governments that, Hacking is something that governments do, and that you, it's, if, if someone steals your information, well, you can't really do anything back because you're stealing their information. Now, I don't know how much exactly the Estonian government is involved in this, but certainly the governments of, um, well, we know the governments of uh, the United States, the UK, the Netherlands have uh, also been actively hacking into the Russians and maybe the Chinese. So, and this leads to a problem of how do you, how do you, what do you do in response because you're doing the same stuff. Now it gets a little more dangerous or interesting when we look at weaponized hacks. And this is a step up from mere espionage 
um, or these logic bombs or various forms of digital sabotage that rises actually to the threshold of war. Uh, the ones best known are these, the Iranian attack called Shamon, which disabled large swaths of the Saudi uh, Arabian oil company, Aramco's computer system, requiring basically about 25,000 computers to be replaced. We know of the attacks on Ukraine's electrical grid in 2014 and subsequently in 2016 and 17, which blanked out large swaths of Ukraine's electricity. And then of course, very famous is the American-Israeli joint Stuxnet virus. Both countries deny they have anything to do with it, but everyone knows they did. Uh, which took down the Iranian nuclear enrichment plant by manipulating the information coming in from centrifuges to make plutonium for nuclear bombs. These are nation state actions, um, but they can be performed by smaller groups. I mean, this is one of the problems of the digital era is that security is once again vulnerable to actions of small groups um, with large effects. Uh, that I mean, basically, war has gotten to the point where really, you know, your your basic single person can't really do much damage, um, but uh, you need a country to develop a nuclear bomb, or maybe a small group can steal a nuclear bomb, but not um, develop one. Uh, but for example, in Los Angeles, about 12 years ago or so, a disgruntled employee of the traffic authority um, hacked into the, the traffic light system in Los Angeles. And Los Angeles has a population of 10 million people. It's a very large city and it is completely car based. And if anyone is young enough or rather old enough to remember uh, a song from uh, from 40 years ago, geez, uh, called No Nobody Walks in LA. Um, you can Google, you can look for it on YouTube. It's a very funny song, but it is, it was about already 40 years ago. You know, you don't have sidewalks in much of uh, Los Angeles. And so, so this guy hacked into it. And what he did was he turned all of the lights in Los Angeles red all at the same time. And he did this on a Friday afternoon. So with a 10 million person city, this has caused enormous, an enormous traffic jam. But actually he was fairly limited in his, um, his imagination. Can you imagine if you have a city of 10 million or imagine even a city of Tartu, um, if you turn all the lights green, so everybody driving sees a green light that just plows through and you can imagine what that will lead to. So these are the kinds of things that um, we can really uh, start to worry about. And of course, then there is our own famous case here in Estonia, the, uh, the DDoS attack, the, um, uh, which I mentioned or talked about last time about how it works. The, um, a distributed denial of service attack in which you just overload services. And I think that is actually in, um, really the, the, that attack in our country here of Estonia is actually the moment at which we can begin to talk about cyber war. Because when I said before there were hackings uh, and the mention, I mentioned the cases that um, already, you know, Shamon and Stuxnet, they came all a little later. But the first time we ever saw a nation state that denied it, but nonetheless, the nation state carry out an act digitally that uh, caused harm was the DDoS attack on Estonia back then. I mean, there had been DDoS attacks before, and they were mainly used for for extortion, uh, much as ransomware is used today where you freeze someone's um, computer files. But back then they shut down basically Estonia's public, public services. They shut down the banks, they shut down the media. 
And so, and I, I, I make my claim that this is the first time we have, we, I mean, that in the future, all histories of cyber war will begin with the DDoS attack on Estonia. They already do, by the way, um, because they fit uh, Karl von Clausewitz is the great German theorist of war's definition of war, which is the continuation of policy by other means. And this was, I mean, there were, there were all kinds of possible policies on the part of Russia in 2007, but they chose to attack, but not kinetically. They did not invade. They just shut Estonia down. And our response to that at the time was to isolate ourselves from the rest of the world so we would not be bombarded by these attacks. And so we're in new territory, very new territory when it comes to all of this. And when you start thinking about what we are, where we are, um, we, we have to realize that when you get rid of mass and velocity or mass and acceleration, then um, the way we have always thought about security must change. Um, every, first of all, and I think the most important aspect is that uh, security has always been a geographic, geographically based. Basically, who's going to attack you? Your neighbors, right? Okay. Well, there's a whole theory about the United States managing to succeed because in the 19th century, they were isolated. Uh, and they were isolated from attacks, basically. Well, mainly from Europe, but uh, I mean, this is before missiles, before planes. And so the U.S. managed to develop without attacks from, uh, from neighbors, unlike all of Europe, which was constantly attacking each other, you know, with Napoleon and with, I mean, the Franco-German War and the Austrians and the Russians coming in. I mean, all of that was going on. We did, we in the United States didn't have that problem. So this is... Um, that has changed now. Of course, already the U.S. can be attacked by um, by missile or by bomber plane, but nonetheless, the point is at this point, no no place is less or more secure than another in the digital realm because it doesn't make any difference. And we've seen this not only with hacks uh, and with ransomware, but even with this in most perhaps most visibly in the last. Uh, six or seven years by disinformations, for example, all of the, I mean, the, we do know that there was a massive disinformation attack on the United States in 2016, followed by a massive disinformation attack on France with the French election in 2017. All of this, all of this we know about and we've talked about. But the, what it really we should be thinking about is where do we go from here? Because if, you, if geography loses its meaning, if the United States, Uruguay, and Estonia are equally vulnerable to a cyber attack, and in the same way, well then, I mean, What's NATO? Why do we have NATO? Well, we have NATO because it's um, because it's based on the on geography and kinetic warfare. It is NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Japan does not belong there, nor does South Korea or Australia, New, New Zealand. Even though we can say, you know. The, those four countries have more in common with the values of the countries in NATO than even some countries in NATO. I mean, if you look at rule of law and democracy, it's, uh, it's hard to say that um, you know, some members of NATO are, are somehow, I mean, they're clearly less democratic than Australia, New Zealand, South Korea, and Japan. So 
we have to start rethinking that aspect of our alliances because it's clear that especially small countries require alliances for their security. But if this alliance does, must it be based on geography or distance? Because in fact, I mean, it's a microsecond difference between whether you are attacked in Estonia or you are attacked in, I don't know, Chile or, or Mexico or wherever. So that is a new aspect of security that we have to start thinking of. And will I predict dominate our thinking about security for a long time to come? Now, connected to that are new problems as well, because as long as you have kinetic warfare, um, there, are, you, there are a couple of things about kinetic warfare, which, uh, which you don't have in cyber effects. The first thing is in kinetic warfare, you basically know who did it. I mean, you'll see a missile coming on a radar or you see a spear coming at you and you know who's throwing that spear at you. I mean, missile or spear, it's, you know where it's coming from <clears throat> and you know who did it. Uh, in the case of cyber attacks, the issue of forensics becomes extremely, extremely difficult because you do not know who did it. And rarely do people uh, claim that they did it because it's much more interesting if you just destroy your enemies, whatever you destroy, but no one knows who did it. And also that's kind of useful because they're not necessarily going to get you back. And this has been a persistent, a persistent problem and is today as well, because I mean, there are cases where you can determine who is, who has attacked you. Uh, and fairly quickly in the case of um, solar winds, the United States determined who did it. And I mentioned all of the various hacks, uh, the, the uh, handwriting of APT 28 and 29 is that it's where everyone is sure that it was in fact, I mean, the Bundestag and the US State Department and the World Anti-Doping Agency were all hacked by people with the same signature. So we know where they're coming from, but other cases you don't really know. And uh, no matter what, you will figure it out a while after it happens and the bigger the time span between when you're attacked and when you you know who did it the harder it is this is go this goes back even to sort of bf skinner's rat psychology that uh, it has a i mean it's much harder to then react uh, so you have to one problem is you don't know who did it so you don't you don't get you don't know quickly enough to, uh, to respond. And then the other big problem that we have with, uh, with cyber war or cyber attacks is that what is a reciprocal proportional response? Now, uh, this is important in security policy. I mean, if, um, all right, we know recently the, it, found out that the that Russian intelligence agency GRU had blown up uh, a arms depot in the Czech Republic and two people died. Now, first you had the problem of a time delay because it took a while to figure that out, far too long. But the other issue is, well, what, do you, what is the reciprocal response to that? I mean, clearly, if they, someone blows up an arms depot, you have to do something. On the other hand, I mean, you're not going to start a nuclear war over it. You're not going to you, uh, appeal to Article 5 in NATO to say, OK, now we're going to go and bomb the hell out of Russia for that. No, you're not going to do that. And now when it comes to cyber attacks, we really don't know what should be a reciprocal and proportional response. And this is something that people in NATO sort of scratch their heads over and people argue. And this is again, something that will, I predict, occupy a lot of thought for the next several years. Now NATO in response to these things has actually gotten to the point where they have, uh, after 
years of pushing back actually agreed at the Warsaw summit to uh, in 2017 to uh, proclaim cyber, whatever that, how it's defined, but cyber as a fourth domain of warfare. That is in addition to the three previous, I mean, still existing domains. I mean, land is a domain of warfare, air is, and sea, you know, sort of traditional, you know, Army, Navy, Air Force. Well, now cyber in the eyes of NATO is the fourth dimension of warfare. The United States already before that had actually declared cyber the fifth domain of warfare because they had already prior to declaring uh, cyber a domain of warfare had, had gone and um, declared space a domain of warfare. So, as I mean, this is going to be a fundamental problem that we will be facing for, I don't know, for as long as these things last, as long as we're around on the planet, because now we have gotten over security as a fundamental issue of, of kinetic warfare. All right, so that's one thing to think about. Uh, related to this, of course, is the future of the electoral democracy in general, when we have uh, forms of manipulation that um, we have not had before. Beginning with actually electoral mechanics. I mean, okay, people were, we have we've seen all the fights in the US about counted votes, uncounted votes. I mean, in, in the digital era, first of all, I mean, this is actually a useful example. I mean, first of all, you have the issue of vote counting. You don't need to do digital elections to already look at counting, which the numbers can be, I mean, you could manipulate voting rolls. We do know that in 2016, Russian hackers penetrated voting roll records, people who vote but they didn't change it. But in fact, if you wanted to cause a mess in elections, you would in fact change the voting roll. You could just change a letter in a person's name. And then when the person goes to vote, then they have to show their ID and then that ID will no longer apply. This was a big fear in 2016 that this would happen. Apparently it did not, but they did. They, the Russians had penetrated the election rolls, voting rolls. Um, vote counting is something else that is done completely digitally. Um, maybe less of a problem in the case of first past the post elections as in uh, the UK and the United States on the other hand, most of Europe uses, um, in general, uh, for a more sort of uh, better uh, sort of approximation of voter sentiment uh, system of uh, proportional voting, uh, where you end up where you end up with more than two parties, and there, of course, calculating how many what the representation will be in Parliament is largely a mathematical. Uh, process based on the number of votes. But if you start, if you change the number of votes going from each election precinct to where the calculations are done, you in fact could alter the result of elections, not to mention disrupting them completely, which has also been a fear that, um, I mean, you can imagine the chaos that will ens would ensue if someone from outside shut down the whole election process, which is also possible to do. So democracy, even at its most basic level of electoral, of elections, needs to be far better, um, far better protected because those things were not possible before. I mean, before the digital era, you couldn't do it. And that's even before we get to the whole issue of fake news and uh, disinformation 
I mentioned last time I talked about, you know, sort of uh, seed, everything, basically stuffing Macron's server um, full of fake information that was so fake that it was too fake to believe. But this was done in response to Hillary Clinton's server being hacked the year before. And so the fear that you have that you know, your election materials will be taken, your emails will be taken, they will be used as part of an election campaign but, or manip to manipulate the results of an election. All these things are now possible that were not before. Um, so uh, we have to start thinking more seriously about our election integrity, the protection of of electoral systems and the electoral process in our democracies. And of course, as I have to quickly point out, you don't have this problem in a non-democracy. And so when we get to the question of, okay, well, you know, the Russians hacked or did this to our electoral system, let's do it back to them. Well, you know, they don't have electoral system to hack. I mean, in, in uh, Rostov, on Don in 2017, uh, Vladimir Putin got 147%. And that was not a hack. Uh, the story behind that was, um, rather, they didn't get 147%. The voting was a 104, excuse me. Yes, the 147% of the people in the district voted. And so, um, and when they investigated how this happened, it was that um, they had called um, the central election district that called up the people in Rostov on Don and said, Putin gets 71%. So the guy at the other end said, okay, he'll get, but what about the other parties? How much do they get? He said, and then the not so bright person who called him said, I don't care. Just give them what they got. So they did, because in fact, Putin did not get 71%. Lots of other parties got quite a bit. So when you add, so if you put in Putin's votes, but you put in all the other votes, then you end up with 147% of people, eligible voters voting. Not too good. Okay, so that's, that's, uh, that's a threat to democracy, perhaps less security related, but it is true that in this kind of si this situation in which you can manipulate elections, there is a crossover between the um, manipulation of elections and things such as I mean, security in NATO. Uh, if you can, why there is less reason to actually uh, to, worry about attacks uh, or sort of physical invasions these days is that it's much cheaper to in fact change governments through election manipulation than it is to invade countries. Uh, if you get, if you can get elected someone who wants to leave NATO, for example, you recall in um, 2017, we had Marine Le Pen running uh, against Emmanuel Macron on the platform of, of uh, France leaving NATO, France leaving the European Union. Um, and now if France leaves the European Union and NATO, I mean, first of all, you've weakened those organizations considerably. Uh, and moreover, I mean, this will lead to a continuation of falling apart and any country, all countries in NATO, uh, with the United States, exception of the United States, but every country in Europe, in NATO or the European Union, is significantly smaller and more subject to pressure um, than Russia, which can pressure and does pressure governments. And so from a security point of view, I mean, it certainly makes it would make a lot more sense. I mean, if I were, if I wanted to sort of with a weak hand, with a, with a bad economy 
uh, and with uh, sort of no matter how good they are, significantly smaller army than all of the armies of NATO combined. What I would do is say, okay, let's be smart. We can't, you know, we can't invade Europe and take that over. Well, besides, you know, the occupation costs will be ridiculous and we'll be there forever. But instead, why don't we change the governments? And if we change the governments, you know, we can get all that we want without losing a lot of people and without spending a lot of money. And, you know, we can just, you know, visa free travel for everybody. And we'll just, everyone can live in France if they want. You can change all that by simply changing the governments. And so that's where we are. Now, moving on to other issues. Um, one problem we will face now, from now on, we are already facing it um, in Europe, or then perhaps the West, is the rise, the rise of a very sophisticated, technologically sophisticated China, which already in the case of Huawei offers very good technology and more cheaply because subsidized by the government more cheaply than uh, any of the other producers of 5G technology, which basically comes down to two companies in Europe, um, which are Ericsson and Nokia, but they produce 5G, the 5G technology that is more expensive because they're not subsidized because we don't do those kind of things in Europe. And of course, so, uh, and the problem with 5G is that it is, uh, it is a significant advance in, um, uh, in that it is from 4G in that it is no longer simply a matter of wiring or hardware but rather it is a it is a hybrid of hardware and software so programmable from a di distance so what everyone is worried about is that okay you get this 5g and you look at it and no this is all safe and secure but tomorrow someone could from china come in and just change it all and then they can listen to everything you're saying this is a big worry of and, um, and so Europe has stood against this um, in some countries, but not all. The United States clearly is against any use of Huawei high tech. And so what we see happening is a, we see, we see the sort of the liberal democratic West flummoxed, worried, concerned about how do we deal with this now rich and technologically sophisticated China that does not share our values and that is actually hostile in, um, in its actions toward the West? Um, the response, unfortunately, up till now has been um, sort of US saying things about China uh, and Europe a little bit, but actually the real problem is that they, and when it comes to these issues, is that Europe is far more concerned about GAFA, which is Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, than it is about China. And this strikes me as utterly absurd. This is not to defend Apple or Google or Facebook. I mean, Apple actually, I would defend because I don't think they're doing anything really bad. Other their main problem is that they're rich and don't pay taxes. None of them pay taxes to a degree. Uh, and this, these are issues that I, I really do need to be resolved that um, these tech companies are making huge amounts of money in Europe, but they do not basically pay taxes. And if the mechanism of that is that say you're Germany with 82 million people and uh, Facebook or Google make huge amounts of money off advertising in um, uh, from the 82 million people in Germany but they only pay taxes and a very, very low amount of taxes in Ireland. So, they, so basically, while they're generating their income in Germany or in France or 
Spain or Estonia or Finland, they only pay taxes in one place and it's very low. And it's all of the, all the income they generate from us who live outside of Ireland in Europe um, doesn't come back. And so this is a fundamental problem. And I understand that nonetheless, we do have to look at a broader picture if there is such a thing as a liberal democratic West, which leads me to the next point, especially because I don't have that much time, <laughs> which is that we have basically two systems developing. Right now we have three systems. And then I, I would hope it turns into two. We have in the in authoritarian regimes, we have what I would call algorithmic authoritarianism. This is China, Russia, other countries as well, slowly, but where you basically track everybody, uh, facial recognition cameras all over, finding people. Um, Apparently, in the last year, Russia has started using a lot of uh, Chinese technology and picking up people who have been uh, seen on videos at demonstrations. I think Belarus is getting this into, into this as well. I mean, it is actually, I mean, Orwell, what Orwell described and wrote in 1948 is kind of coming true in those places, not to mention all of the censorship that goes on in those countries digitally. And so you can't really use, you can't write what you want on email. And then you have the US model, which is uh, Shona Zuboff in her big cinder block of a book calls surveillance capitalism. And this is this what, the, what GAFA, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, again, Apple shouldn't be in that, but the other ones are making huge amounts of money tracking what you look at and then selling you advertising. It is called data scraping. In 2001, 2002, Google, uh, the founders of Google, Sergey Brin and um, was Gates, whatever his first name is, I don't remember at the moment, um, were going broke. The company is going bankrupt. Uh, because they didn't know how to make money. And then Eric Schmidt came along and a couple of other people and said, no, no, you have all this data. You have all this data. You know what people look at. Use that data and sell ads, which they started doing. And then they became one of the richest companies in the world. Uh, in Europe, we are faced with those issues, but we don't regulate them. At the same time, Europe does have a fundamental concern with privacy and uh, we have in Europe been dealing with that. And in fact, the legislation that we came up with two years ago, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, is something that in fact, even the state of California has copied in order to reduce surveillance. But, but both the Europe and the United States are basically still believe in fundamental rights and freedoms, free competitive elections, rule of law. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, which stands in stark contrast to the authoritarian, um, the authoritarians who are using all of these digital means. I can't, I mean, my gut feeling says that um, if we manage to overcome the transatlantic differences on this, that we're going to have a bipolar world. Uh, really between those who are using digital technology to keep their populations their own populations in contr under control and use digital means to undermine other countries. And then you'll have a liberal democratic West that says basically does not or regulates the use of technology as to whether you're going to, mm, uh, what I mean, that are, will be limit the right to track people, both by governments and by companies, and really is not at all interested in controlling or doing anything to either Russia or China, except hope it, hope they change. Now, those are all threats, basically. <laughs> Let me just end with a few positive things that we can, in fact, do to make Europe work better, for example. All right, I mean, we have, one uh, while, 
but we are, I mean, mostly Europe has become quite advanced digitally in terms of you know, people, especially after COVID, I mean, buy things online and are used to doing all kinds of things online. What, what we really need, and, and countries vary in terms of degree of digitization of public services, but public services up to now have been strictly, or the quality of public services has been strictly a nation state matter. Uh, in Estonia, as I'm sure you've heard countless times, uh, you can basically do anything involving the government or public services online. Other countries, not so much. Well, in fact, if we, I, my position, and again, you can disagree, but I think that I, what we really, if you want to create a feeling of inclusivity, then we should be doing things that, in fact, allow you to use public services across Europe. Uh, that uh, been minor steps in that direction, but I mean, I give you an example. Um, um, 10 years ago, I went to the president of Finland and I said, look, you guys are using the same system we are for digital prescriptions. Why don't and we get 7 million Finns visiting Estonia a year? Uh, no fewer Estonians go to Finland, but nonetheless, why don't we do it so that the a digital prescription that works in Finland would also work in Estonia and vice versa? And uh, President Ninista said, great idea, let's do it. Now, the technology for that maximum three months, I mean, three weeks to put in place because the technology exists on both sides of, of the Gulf of Finland, but to get it going from one side to the other, and so it shouldn't take much. Well, in fact, it took eight years, eight years to get it to work. Well, it was all had to do with regulation, we had to do with avoiding arbitrage, that is, you know, you cannot, the prices have to be equivalent or you, I mean, a Finn can come to Estonia and buy medicine more cheaply here and then take it back to Finland, all these issues had to be resolved. We see the, the same, we see that again with technology, again, we see a huge problem with lack of legislation when we come to a very, um, uh, a very current issue, which is vaccine passports. The technology for vaccine passports has been developed. They work. I have a digital vaccine passport. Other people in other countries also have digital vaccine passports, all operating basically on a QR code or barcode, which is machine readable. And it even, you know, it's taken into account the uh, the privacy issues there all, I'm sure, at least the ones that I know which exist, are GDPR compliant, so you're not going into anyone's data, but they don't work across borders. I mean, they work inside. I mean, someone possibly here in Estonia could read my Estonian, but if you're French and you come to Estonia, we, ha we haven't gotten to the point where we can read the QR code of a French vaccine passport and vice versa. We're not there. So if I go to France and I want to enter France, I show my thing and it says, okay. Instead, I have this, unfortunately, I'm speaking from Tallinn today and I didn't, don't have it with me, but those of you, who, any of you who have a paper vaccine passport with, that says you have been vaccinated, you look at it, you'll see that in my case at least, written by hand, received vaccine on this day and whatever other information is there. And then it's signed, scribbled by a doctor and then it has a traditional stamp on it, on a printed piece of yellow paper or a booklet. Do we trust that? I mean, instead of a QR code passport that is all GDPR compliant? Well, apparently so, because that's what we can trust and that is acceptable for me to go to another country. Whereas if I have a secure digital passport, no. So 
What we need to work on far more is to get the legal basis for a liberal democratic digital society created. And we need to do it at the European level. Uh, we will need to develop this also on, um, uh, on a transatlantic level. We need to make things work. And I'll basically end with this to understand, so you understand how difficult it is. I mean, I'm on this World Health Organization Europe uh, Commission, where I sort of chair the chair the um, tech and innovation working group, and it's. Where I mean, one of the first problems we face is that okay, getting getting a vaccine passport working in Europe, the European Union, that is, is extremely difficult, very very difficult, but that's manageable. Now the problem comes in is that the World Health Organization for Europe does not only include the European Union, which consists of 27 countries, it also has another 30 countries in it. I mean, Russia, for some reason, Kyrgyzstan, Kazakhstan, Moldova, I mean, they're all in this organization. How are we going to do things so that we can, a person from one of those countries can come visit Europe. You will need to have a vaccine passport. Do you really want to trust some of these countries' paper vaccine passports? Yeah, not based on previous experience. On the other hand, uh, well, how are we going to get them? I mean, how do how do we create that system whereby we can trust their digital passport system uh, with a secure and which then allows also at the same time complete reciprocity that you can go to Russia and show your vaccine passport, I mean, digitally, and all they get is the fact that you are in fact certified vaccinated and not get anything else. These are the kinds of problems that we will face maintaining a liberal democratic society based on free and fair elections, rule of law, constitutionalism, and human rights. All in the digital age where all those assumptions that we had up till the digital age have kind of disappeared. So with that, I have once again spoken more than I should have. We're Long totally fine. <laughs> so I thought maybe today also uh, we could, you know, sort of open it up more for discussion. Absolutely. Great. So I think that was a fantastic uh, tour d'horizon, I would almost say, on security, democracy and technology. Uh, even our big tech uh, got their fair share. Uh, I would like to ask Albina, are you ready to put your question forward? Yes. Uh I would like you just activate your camera, please, so we can see you. Sure, it would be great if that's a possibility. Yes. So uh, I would like to uh, to ask my question about your tweet from seventeenth of April, because you were talking. Uh, it was a time when was uh, escalating the conflict between Russia and Ukraine, and uh, in the tweet you say that there. Uh, Maybe there should be a time out for any, I mean, any videos from Russia up to the invasion of Crimea. These people were arrogantly demanding to do the free travel with the EU. Just free speeders except for family emergencies. Is it year of security at stake in us? So my question is, how exactly are connected the security of Europe and the presence of ordinary Russians in Europe? Well, there were two ordinary tourists who poisoned Skripal. Ordinary tourists. But don't you think that it's violate their human right on freedom of movement? No, you don't have a freedom of movement into the United States. You need a visa or into the into Europe. There is no freedom of movement into. There is no such right. 
There's a freedom of movement within the European Union for citizens of the European Union. Everyone else, unless they have visa-free travel, has to get a visa. There is no such right, and I think you have a fundamental misunderstanding of what human rights are. There is no right for you to enter Europe if you are not a European citizen. Right now, American citizens cannot enter Europe at all. So you think it's justified just to ban 145 million of people? Well, if ordinary, so-called ordinary tourists are killing people in Europe, blowing up buildings, killing people, shooting people in Berlin in the back of the head, I would really not want to have people from that country in Europe. And that's, unless you change your government to make it behave, there's nothing else we can do. I'm terribly sorry to interrupt, but isn't this a giant overgeneralization of a, a government versus its people? I'm not trying to overly criticize here, but I'm just curious about the perspective of zero sum games in this regard. Look, it was uh, 280, <clears throat> 280 character tweet in response to the murder of two people and by Russians agents in Europe. Now, I'm not getting into a philosophical debate about this, but fun the fundamental understanding that you might have a right to enter the European Union is utterly absurd. Okay, let us go on to uh, the more focus on our, on our, of our talk. So basically, Voter, I mean, uh, you were already opening your microphone, but uh, maybe you can elaborate on your stand regarding the 5G, respectively the use of uh, Chinese technology in our networks here. Yes, thank you very much. Um, so what I'm curious about is uh, the relationship between the uses of foreign technology for 5G and the narrative that is created around it. Um, being wary of foreign investment in new technology is a, an important matter, in my opinion, because I agree that it risks opening us up to potential external threats. But if we don't properly regulate how to use new technologies such as 5G, uh, similar challenges could actually arise as internal threats. You can imagine, for example, um, the recent European Court of Justice case uh, towards Estonia with regards to Estonia's snooping law. Um, in this case, it was found that um, the Estonian government collects too much metadata um, in its criminal proceedings. Um, 5G opens up a whole new level of information gathering. And I'm curious how the European Union is supposed to um, defend the security and the privacy of its citizens, but at the same time optimize the use, usability of 5G as a common technology. That's a big problem. What can I say? <laughs> I mean, that's what the, the European Commission has to draw up the legislation for that. And right now, it's not doing a great job. Um, I More broadly, I do think that the, uh, <clears throat> there's a misguided emphasis on privacy in the European Union uh, in that the real issue is <clears throat> data integrity, not privacy. Because data integrity is somewhat <clears throat> is making sure your data has not been changed, which is a much, much, much bigger issue than, I mean, <clears throat> even in the case of privacy. What happens if someone has changed your data that in fact has you speaking to terrorists? I mean, we are not guaranteeing uh, integrity at all. So. <clears throat> Uh, unless we start dealing with the with integrity and privacy together, uh, the issue of privacy becomes utterly ridiculous because you can actually, if you can change the data of, of <clears throat> people, then if you're going to look at what their data are, having been um, and it's been changed, you're in a lot of trouble. We are all in a lot of trouble then would you argue that perhaps the way forward for um, 5G normalization in a sense is also to move forward 
relatively aggressively perhaps with open data initiatives to um, also normalize the idea of um, availability of information and um, the the possibility to reliably check this information because if okay, privacy exactly. is the main perceived okay, yeah. problem the real problem is data manipulation i don't see how privacy and data manipulation is assisted by open data does not have private data it's anonymized data so i don't see how that helps um well I would imagine that um, the the steps towards a society where data privacy is less prioritized uh, than data uh, verifiability requires several steps. A lot of um, European countries right now have a substantial focus on this uh, level of privacy and they might uh, need to step by step move towards a a new kind of approach which is more open towards data in general i would imagine open data though anonymized data uh, might perhaps open the floodgates towards being more open-minded towards uh, pre personal privacy in general i don't think so that's a major major assumption the thing you cannot you cannot use data and open data that is not anonymized that is what privacy laws <clears throat> guarantee that the data that goes into open data can in no way be traced back to the person or the people that, that provide those data. So I do not see open data in any way being connected to, to privacy uh, legislation other than that you can't be identifiable in any open data case. Okay, clear, thank you. Okay, Louis. So you go to a more philosophical. Yeah, yeah this is, yes. Uh, thank you again, President Ilves, for another really illuminating and insightful lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, you know, I am somebody with a military background, so that, that made it really interesting. And Christopher Coco, of course, is probably one of the best uh, civilian minds writing on the military. But he, he sort of took a step back uh, with his book, The Rise of the Ooh. Civilization. Uh, Christopher Coker from London School of Economics. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's a highly theoretical and very philosophical, but uh, Christopher Coker presents us with the idea of the civilization state, and in short, his argument is that powers such as Russia and China will use the sort of uh, counter enlightenments uh, against Western powers to say that their their society is civilizational, and this is used as a means to justify the things that you talked about and more, uh, what they do. So my question is probably very loaded, but in short, uh, for the time that we have, how would you say Europe and especially the European Union, not the US, but just Europe, so not the West, could counter this without going down the road of increasingly giving in to sort of these nationalist far right powers, but maintain a soft power stance against rising powers such as China? And China? Well, it's tough because basically the nationalist far right is driving the same kind of traditionalist uh, agenda as Putin. I mean, right? I mean, <laughs> they're brothers in arms. And in fact, you can see the connections between all of the various hard right, <clears throat> from the neo-Nazis to just the big hardcore nationalists, basically having the same rhetoric as Putin about gay rope, uh, liberals are bad. I mean, you see this and Hungary, and you see this, you know, you see this in Le Pen, and you see, I mean, you see this in Estonia. Um, so, uh, <laughs> this is one of our fundamental political pro political issues. How do we get out of this situation? Um, <clears throat> except perhaps by saying none of none of our none of the good things that have happened to us in technology would be possible. Uh, without the enlightenment. So if you want to be counter enlightenment, you might as well just stop developing here, right? I mean, let's go this way. The mullahs would never be able to develop an atom bomb. They can only copy what was done before. Great, let us continue on the liberal democratic West. Josh, please.
Are you still? Yeah, you're still with us, but you're muted and sorry. You sorry about that. Yeah. No worries. Great. Um, so my question here is, uh, how likely do you think that the liberal democratic list is uh, to enact additional regulations limiting tracking uh, by large companies uh, and and governments, even though that's not necessarily as much of an issue currently. Uh, in the US, you have the companies are lobbying the legislators to keep the status quo, and it seems hard to see uh, anything changing anytime soon with this. Uh, what do you think about that? Well, it's their basic economic model, and so I don't see it possibly changing. I think perhaps more fruitful is on. <clears throat> is, um, is uh, what is uh, in the United States Section 230 of the Federal Communications Act, which uh, says that media companies, I mean, that internet companies are not liable for what's posted on their material, uh, on their medium. So you cannot sue Facebook for what people post on it which lots and lots of people think is ultimately what allows them just to, to, I mean, not only put anything up there, not moderate, but even sort of develop algorithms that lead you to more and more extreme material, especially in the case of YouTube. But I think that is, uh, that's an area where we will be moving into, but uh, undercutting the, uh, the revenue model of, of, of all of these, um, so I mean, it's not just Facebook and YouTube, but it's basically every media outlet you click on. You know, if you go on a newspaper, you have to agree that they can, you can have cookies or you can disagree, but, I mean, basically, that's, that is the new revenue model uh, for digital in the digital age. And I don't see that changing, frankly. With that in mind, right, let me uh, tune in before I give our infamous Walter uh, another time the floor. Um, so what I was referring or referring to, you made a distinction between Google and Apple. You're basically saying that Google was a bit better than uh, than than uh, Apple was a bit better than Google. But what's the basis for that, right? I mean, only because they seem seem to be a bit more sympathetic and and actually protecting our privacy, at least claimingly so, uh, a bit better than uh, than Google does, or they make a bit less, or their revenue model is not so much focused. Well, they're not making it. Yeah, their revenue model is not focused on tracking. Yeah. You. Their revenue so, model is selling you stuff, but. I don't have a problem with, I mean, I have no problem with, I mean, I can either buy no, no, let me, let me just finalize. I, I just want to see. So, so what could be actually the guidance for regulating big tech? Is it just going to be that, that they don't make money of our uh, private data or that they are neutral to the process? What, what could be the, the, the guiding principles for us? Well, I think for the first one is actually pay your taxes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but then all of them are bad, right? I mean, yeah, that all of them are bad in that sense. I mean, in Europe, I don't know. Uh, and, and I'm actually surprised that the United States actually is like, you know, even when this even this didn't happen with France, hmm. impose tariffs on France, even though they hadn't done anything hmm. on wine and cheese from France. Uh, so, I mean, that was Trump, but I mean, they're, they haven't rescinded those. The point is that you, it is, I don't see it as politically viable that these companies can make so much money off something that in any case is objectionable to large swaths of people and not pay taxes. You should be at least say, okay, well, they're using your data of what chair you want to buy, but it means you're getting a little more Autobahn built for you, right? I mean, something like that. I mean, in the end, we end up uh, in the same problem. How do we go, how are we going to regulate uh, the non-territorial space, right? So in the end, the virtual space, so how are we going to regulate that? And how are we going to regulate that if not everyone is chipping in? Yeah? Or what are we going to do with those countries that basically say, like, we don't adhere? But well, you also, that will lead to other things. I mean, yeah. it, I mean, every once in a while, not too much, but nonetheless, sometimes... Um, 
you will run into a site that says uh, from the United States mainly. This is, you know, we are not GDPR compliant. Sorry, you can't see it. Um, I mean, the LA Times, which is a major newspaper, had that problem for a long time, right? I mean, Absolutely. they just didn't bother. They said, Fuck, I'm gonna, you know, we don't want to do that. So they didn't have readers in Europe because, you know, they didn't do, I mean, it's not so hard to be GDPR compliant, but. In any case, there will be limitations, but um, most of them actually do follow at least those minimal standards that were set by GDPR. Yeah. Um, so more and interesting, I think, and more worrisome, I think, is that there are cases where these tech companies are more powerful than nation states. And the most recent case was last year in which um, in, in the tracking app that was offered by Apple and Google. Now, basically, if an app is not on Android or Apple on iOS or whatever the you know, Google thing is called, you can't get it. You can't download it. There is no, I mean, like an app that is not on one of those platforms is virtually impossible to get. And so, but then they set up certain standards. Um, and so every country has, a, has one app, which is on there, except for France, which I'll get to, but a tracking app. And then they set standards of levels of privacy, which are, which are basically designed for Belarus. Uh, because so that I mean designed against Belarus that is that no one knows who you met where you met them now this kind of disrupt this kind of destroys the entire concept of contact tracing if you don't know who you met and so the information all the information that you get out of this the trapping apps the based I mean that I mean the Estonian one or the Latvian or any of these is that you have run into someone who has COVID, now you have to isolate, okay? Does that help tracking in any way? No, it doesn't help tracking. And in fact, it doesn't, since that information is not even reported to the CDC or the Central Health Authority, it's only you know that you have been isolated. And you might, if you want, inform your doctor. <laughs> so, and they, this was designed so that they wouldn't run into problems. I mean, that they wouldn't really, I mean, you could see how that would be a problem with Belarus, China, or Russia. China wouldn't take it anyway, but on the other hand, uh, when, you, when you say, if you talk to them and said, look, you know, we're a, you know, we're a member of the EU, we're a rule of law based state, we don't have that. And then the answer from Android and Google is that, look, we don't have time to de deal with all these little countries. This is the way it works and that's going to be the way it works. And we just don't want, we want to make sure that, you know, we don't have any problems with human rights violations. Well, I mean, you design, so the state basically has, I mean, is, uh, the these two companies have decided how states will manage their health care. I mean, that's those are the kinds of issues that I think we will <clears throat> we will run into more. It's received relatively little attention because, of course, I mean, compared to the whole COVID problem, it's huge. True. I mean, so, the whole the COVID problem is huge. This is not like all it means is that they were useless apps with very low uptake that didn't really provide any information and was not like followed at all. So I mean, actually, we're going there uh, with uh, another question from Walter into uh, a more technical direction, right? So I mean, we one of the problems that we have with the internet right now is that basically it's a completely stateless protocol. Yeah. So I mean, you can do one information request today and then you do the next one tomorrow and essentially you should get still be able to continue and then we do this a bit of, a, of an artificial session control to to compensate for the lack of technical uh, requirements or specifications in this old protocol and basically what Walter is asking uh, is can we do something with the Estonian EID to fix some of those problems Walter please uh, yes thank you 
Um, in a way, you've already answered this question at the end of Josh's uh, question by explaining how the revenue system currently works. Uh, admittedly, the internet is only about 40, 45 years old, and this revenue system that we have right now is only about a decade old. So there is still some room. The, the, internet, the internet is like the HTTP um, protocol invented in 1989, and it was useless until the first web browser in 1993. So 40 is like. Yes, exactly. Um, apologies for the slight inconsistency in the exact year, but continuing onwards. Um, so in the extension of Josh's earlier question, I was wondering if you see any room for um, a system like Estonia's EID system to inspire new methods of connecting to the internet um, so that the control over personal data is directly linked to your digital identity. And as such, you as an individual can also exert more control over this. Um, taking into account, of course, that this might lead to more uh, compliance or inaccessibility issues with websites that operate outside of the European Union that don't adhere to the same standards, much like how the GDPR uh, case um, happened with the media outlets that were not GDPR compliant. Yeah, you know, I think you're running the opposite problem. People do not want to give, use their identities anywhere. People want to remain anonymous. And so they will not. And I mean, why, why is the US so far behind when it comes to uh, public services on the internet? Because it's your, it's your God given right not to give your name. No one, I mean, it, there, is no, there is no national identity in the United States. You will not get one ever. Only mention, I mentioned the time on the internet is that it's a lot shorter than we realize. We're really only at the beginning of this. I mean, we're kind of like at the stage of, uh, in the, with, you know, after James Watt invented the steam engine it took like another 50 years before anyone decided to put it on wheels and make a locomotive, right? So we're, we're only at the beginning. Then if we're only at the beginning, should a America-centric uh, perspective dictate how we operate in Europe as well? Because that seems to be what's happening right now for the most part where um, the dominance of American tech companies largely influences how we in uh, the European Union regulate the internet for the purpose of accessing these tech companies' services. Well, Europe could start producing something itself. Exactly. <laughs> Very <laughs> fair point. <laughs> I mean, I would, you know, if there were something like Amazon in Europe that was not Amazon, I would prefer that right away. If there was a, you know, a reasonable search engine that was as good as Google, I would prefer that right away. I mean, if someone produced mobile phones as innovative as Apple, I'd be the first one to buy it. So, uh, I mean, uh, the problem comes, I mean, there are two problems in Europe. And one of them is the law, the other one is culture. The law part is that, and Europe is to blame for this, we have not created a digital single market. There is no, I mean, so, I mean, I, I, I was faced with this uh, seven years ago, six years ago, when a student, uh, a very bright engineer, got uh, $200,000 or euros for a, uh, for a little startup he had. And since when I was in office, I would invite people who'd done something and said, well, come on in and we drink some tea and, you know, very good. I'm glad, you know, students are happy. They get to meet. And he goes, well, Mr. Burgess, I'm sorry, but I'm leaving for the United States in two weeks. I go, why are you doing that? He goes, well, for one, this does not work in these little countries including Germany, it has to, I need a lot of customers and I can't get them the way the system is set up. And the other thing is that I can get, it's much easier to get money there. And in fact, a half year later, he had 
He had six million dollars in investments, and three years later, he sold his company for a hundred million dollars from two hundred thousand. Now, the reason he could do that, and what you cannot do that in Estonia or in Germany uh, uh, or anywhere else in Europe, continental Europe, you can a little bit in the UK. There is no, there is uh, too little private equity. 80% of investments in Europe are banks, invested in banks. 20% is private equity. In the United States, it's the opposite. 80% of investment is private equity and 20% are banks. So now to see what that means, think of you're in 1975 and you're someone who has recently said you do not believe in bathing taking showers. And then you walk into Deutsche Bank and say, I have my friend Waz and I here have this idea. We're building in our garage a personal computer. We don't know whether to call it an apple or an orange yet. That was Steve Jobs in 1975. And he got money to build Apple from private equity. If you walk into Deutsche Bank and you look like him and talk like him, you will be thrown out of there in 15 seconds. The first question you are asked if you want a, if you're a startup in Germany or in Estonia is, so what collateral are you bringing? Your house, what, what you know, I mean, that's the problem. So we're not, I mean, so the, the, that's a fundamental cultural problem in, this, in Europe is lack of private equity investment. The other problem in terms of creating a single market is equally large and that is up, that's Europe's fault. Don't blame GAFA for that. If you had a single digital market, it would not be a problem. Right now, in fact, GAFA has all of these separate markets. First of all, you had this problem for 10 years after I, uh, whatever, the music program that they have, uh, Apple. Music. Music. Or uh, iTunes. iTunes, right. It didn't work in Eastern Europe because they didn't have the, indiv they didn't bother with these little countries to create the individual, uh, uh, intellectual property rights agreements, which you have to sign. Even to this day, to show how a single market doesn't work, is that I cannot buy an iTunes record on iTunes for my wife because her credit card is a Latvian credit card. We're in the same bank, but I can't buy her an iTunes because they're different because they see, okay, you have a that one or that one. So we do not have a digital single market. This is not a problem in the United States. If I want to buy a record in California for a friend of mine in New Jersey, <laughs> who cares? But isn't that more a misunderstanding of Europe by, by Apple? No? I mean, that, I mean they're just basing it on the on the financial market rather than no, that's the based framework on together. The, no, that's based on the IPO. I mean, the I, intellectual property legislation, each one of those is different. That's Europe's thing to fix. I mean, okay, there really, we don't have a single market. That's also clear. We still don't have the European brand. It's still, I mean, I think it's only 20 out of the 27 member states of the EU. So it clearly is one. No, of but the I'm saying we different. cannot, I mean, GAFA, you can blame, but don't blame them for things that we can fix. If we want to, and that's the lack of willingness, I think, to a large extent. I think we have clearly identified the political elite as one of the issues that we have to work on in Europe and to educate. And that's also, I think, a bit of the task for us in the, in the master program on politics and governance in the digital age. Let's open up for our last round of, of inputs before I would suggest that we come to an end, maybe with some last words. So are there any questions, last ones? You have your chance. It's the last uh, talk of the lecture series. I mean, there are others, but not ones on technology, democracy, and security. Yeah, Voter didn't come up with a new question. He certainly made a name for himself during this lecture series. 
No? Okay, I don't. Jason, neither. Okay, then I would say it's up to you, Thomas, for some last roundup. I would say, you know, it was a fantastic tour that you gave us uh, on the base of your experience and also how you perceive technology and, and, and the impact that it has on our democracy and, and how it's endangering all of our security. Any last things you want to give us on the way? Well, I would say that this is, these are future issues that will occupy us for until we have a new technological revolution <laughs> in some other way. But at this point, you, it's pretty clear that these issues will occupy us preoccupy us more and more and more. And uh, if, I mean, I do not see a traditional uh, either academic study of politics without taking this into account, or I don't see, I mean, I don't see even traditional politics lasting in this kind of condition. We already know that in the U, that in the UK elections, in the Dutch referendum on Ukraine, in the US elect presidential elections, the Macron elections, that the results were in one way or another affected in by, by the fact that we live in a digital era. And you have to take this into account. You have to take into account you live in a social media era that would never existed before. And that 20 years ago, you had your, your national newspapers, and then you maybe had a, in Europe, you had a Herald Tribune and a Financial Times that operated as a pan-European pan news source, but that's it. Now that doesn't apply. So you're going, I mean, politics and policies will, will be all affected by this, and you should be prepared for it. If you really want to make, I mean, I think one area that really is going to be crucial is uh, law, since all of these things, all these things will have to be regulated. And if you, and one of the fundamental problems I see overall, which is what I talked about very, in, very early in the beginning, is CP Snow's two cultures in which, as you may recall, C.P. Snow talked about, you know, physicists and poets, but right now we're dealing with techies, tech bros, and, and, and democratic politicians. Where they come together and where you can make it work is in law, because that's what regulates, um, regulates the tech, taking into account democracy and where you, you, these issues come out. Whereas, I mean, you wouldn't, surveillance is not something that would come out on the, until you have like laws on it. And so if I would give anyone any, any advice on what to do for their careers at a young age, <laughs> study law and learn to code, do those two together. Um, uh, basically, in fact, Tartu University, as far as I know, is the only place in the world that offers a joint degree in technology, in IT and law. That's what you're, that's one place you can do it. But I mean, I would basically say you should study both. I think they're pretty, pretty well off our students as they're focusing on governance and politics with their program as well, of a good understanding of technology, but certainly a minor in, in law wouldn't hurt. I would say, and then to take some uh, but classes coding, coding. You have to understand the code. You have to understand the tech side. Just as I argue that these tech bros do need to have a crash course in ethics. Indeed. Okay. We had a wonderful uh, tour. We have a wonderful outlook. A lot of us uh, to learn. So hello world is not going to be the end, but uh, certainly the beginning. And with that, I would like to thank uh, President Professor Ilves uh, for your kind uh, lecture series. And we're looking forward to further interactions and possibilities. All right. Well, I'm giving one tomorrow in Estonia. Yes. Perfect. So that we 
already have interest uh, shown for in the in the chat and but maybe you want to tell uh, the audience what you're going to talk about i'm going to compress this course into <laughs> okay, good. into into one hour or 50 minutes and i will talk about it strictly from a european point of view okay great thank you so much tune in and here you all see you soon thank you Bye -bye.